and welcome to the Maythorn Monthly for April and I'm not even going to tell you where I am. To get to Peterborough from Liverpool by train it's best to use the mainline routes. So in this case we take the Trans Pennine route up to Leeds, get onto the East Coast Main Line, back down to Peterborough. Yes, I'm back in Peterborough and I've come here by train as you may have guessed and we're about to head out to Hampton. I'm staying in a hotel in the city centre so the first thing I have to do is take an early morning bus out to Hampton. Progressive property is in the area of Hampton Lakes and it's also very convenient that there's a big retail park there so that we can go and get any food or drink we want as the day progresses. I arrive for the registration at 8.30 and I'm one of the first so as the sun's out I take a cup of coffee into the car park and find a little coffee table to put it on. As well as the basic property strategies, we also learn how to take good property photographs and we hear from guest speakers and they tell us the why that made them successful in business. 1981, a nightclub in North Dublin is hosting a disco for St. Valentine's Day. Sometime after midnight, a fire breaks out in a room above. Unbeknownst to the 841 patrons below, the fire rages into a blistering inferno. Soon enough, the fire falls down onto the dance floor, turning the club into a hell that the victims cannot escape from. Paul McNeve tells us the story of the nightclub fire where he lost all his friends and nearly his own life as well. An amazing story of his recovery and a turnaround into a 50 million euro business. In sunshine or in shadow Oh Danny boy, oh Danny boy I love you so it's no wonder he's grateful for being alive and happy to burst into song in front of us and if you want to read the full story he has actually published a book all about it. Let us remember the suffering and pain The survivors and the victims of the fire and our tin The mothers and fathers forever to mourn The 48 children who never came home And I filmed that at the Progressive Property Training Room in Hampton, which is part of Peterborough. Say hello, Peterborough. Peterborough is straddled across the River Neen and I try to show you something a little different every time I go here. On the south side of the river there's a boat which I've passed many times and never gone to see what it's all about. The boat appears to house two businesses, there's Charter's Real Ale Bar and the East Restaurant Company which uh, I gather is a Chinese restaurant. Here's this month's piece of wall art or wall mural. It's all around the outside seating area by this boat. I was passing this fair on the way back to my hotel every night and I was catching it at sunset last month but this is taken on my final night when I was due to go home the following morning so I stayed up a bit late and I went for a walk around the fair to get a closer look at it.
moving back down towards the south coast and we visit Chichester. Now last October I showed you the cathedral was all behind hoarding so we were doing a lot of renovation work particularly to the cathedral roof. So it's now all been cleared away and we're also going to look at that church opposite St Peter the Great or was it? It still looks like a church on the outside, but this is what it looks like on the inside. We decided to get a caffeine hit before we headed back to Portsmouth on the bus. The bus service between Chichester and Portsmouth is the 700, it will take us back to the hard and the buses are quite nice inside, they have all the usual things that buses have these days so you can charge your phone and get your free Wi-Fi and having a two-line destination display at the front of the top deck is also very useful. Now we're filming from a rainy window in the top deck of the bus as we head towards Portsmouth and South Sea Railway Station. You'll see a train going over the top, we are going underneath. There's been roadworks in this area for the last couple of years when I've been coming to Portsmouth, so I'm wondering if someday it'll all be finished. And as we head back towards Portsmouth Harbour, a bus that's just left there is heading towards Chichester. And that was the 700. Let's stay with buses and head back to Cambridgeshire. The buses you'll see now, they're even smarter double-deckers than the ones we've just shown you, and this is on a route between Peterborough and Norwich, although we'll be getting on at Wisbeach. The buses are run by Excel and the route between Norwich and Peterborough has four variations so the routes are actually not numbered, they're called A, B, C and D. As you can probably see the seats are very comfortable, they kind of wrap you in nicely, they're reclined and for those who've got families you can sit in a group of four with a table. Each seat has all the usual mod cons including wireless internet, a USB outlet to charge your devices and even a button to stop the bus when you're ready. If you don't like sitting next to anyone, you prefer to be on your own, there's some seats for you too. And the displays on the front are a bit more than two lines of information. They're a full colour LCD and they give you a lot more information, satellite tracking and everything you could need to know. And the city centre shopping is in the Queensgate centre and the bus station is just below so you go down escalators, lifts or stairs, whichever you choose, to get the bus. Or if you're leaving the city by train there's a bridge across the dual carriageway that will take you over to where the railway station is. Now if you're thinking you didn't see much of Wisbeach, I have some of that too, so let's finish this People and Places spot with a trip back to Wisbeach to see what's there. I'm glad I stopped at the Costa Coffee because they were giving away free muffins this afternoon and I had one while I was in the shop and one for the road. Perhaps the girl thought I needed feeding up, although that's highly unlikely. A couple of things worthy of mention, the interesting way that they tell you which street you're in, and let's face it, it'll be quite difficult to steal these street signs. Wisbeach has a castle, um, except it doesn't. If you look through the history, the castle's no longer there. It has a castle cafe and a few other things, but find me a castle? Well, I couldn't see one.
Octavia Hill was born in Wisbeach. I didn't know who she was either, but maybe you do. One of the founders of the National Trust. Her house and her plaque, you can see them here. And that ends our quick tour of some of the places we've been to see in the UK in the last month. We're back for an update on the Burnley Bungalow, and let's show you where it is. The bungalow fronts onto a housing estate, but at the rear, and the reason for the rear extension, it's open fields in the forest of Burnley. So let's see how they've been going since we last visited. There's been a load of hardcore going down underneath where the main extension will be, and then that was concreted over, and you'll see that we have also upright steel beams to support the structure that will be built. The video that Steve's been sending me is filmed at different times of day and on different dates, but you can see the progress as you follow it through. Moving on to a very dramatic day when this truck turned up and as you can see it has the horizontal steel beams and it's got to lift them over the bungalow and round the back. I was extremely nervous just watching this but the men obviously have done this kind of thing before and they were confident. The driver remote controls this crane from a handheld device, which must be fairly complex I reckon, and it reminded me of the controller I have when I'm flying a drone, in that I can fly it from one position until it goes out of sight, and then I tend to have to move round and see it from a different angle to get uh, a different set of shots. Uh, well, the technique here would appear to be that you stand at the front of the bungalow and you use the remote control to guide the beam across the roof, and then you have to move round the back when you have to guide it down and lower it into position. You'll notice as the video progresses that the driver with his remote control is quite often up on the roof doing that. What struck me when I was watching this was that the beam has a single pivot point from the crane and so has a tendency to swing round and we don't know a lot about the wind speed on this day but it would be quite easy for the whole thing to flip and be very difficult to control. The men are ready to catch it, you'll notice that they have ladders on each of the uprights and it is their job to actually secure the beam in place, but first the crane driver has to get it the right way around and in the right direction. Once I got over the nervousness of watching this operation and I noticed the driver lowers the beam down to the level of the two men below so that they can get it in the right position and then they can go up the ladder and secure it in place. But it actually gets lowered down enough for them to manoeuvre it in the first place. Once you've got one hole aligned and the beam twisted at the right angle you can then start putting the final bolts in.
When you view this crane from the road, it really is an astounding sight, and it proved to me that I know very little about cranes because I have in my mind a mental picture of a type of crane that this definitely isn't. So there are obviously quite a lot of different types of cranes for different jobs, and I've not seen one like this before. Notice that this man doesn't even look at the controls, he's just working them with his fingers. He's looking up at exactly where the beam is and moving his fingers to keep that thing in place. There's another truck outside the bungalow and it's more concrete. I've seen an awful lot of concrete being delivered to this project, so I asked Steve exactly how much they'd had and he thought it was about 100 tonnes of the stuff so far. Environmentalists are not particularly happy about the amount of concrete we use in our building projects around the country, but until they find something eco-friendly that will do the job, the concrete has to stay. We'll have more from Burnley from the bungalow next month, but right now we're going back to the Wirral because uh, I have quite small jobs compared with what we've been looking at, just doing little tinkering with my house in Wallasey. Uh, we won't be zooming in too closely on the back garden because it's a bit of a mess, but that will be dealt with another time. This is the room I was advertising last month. We now have a tenant for it and he's very happy indeed with the easy chair and the view down to the river, particularly with the better weather coming on. Well, that's what we believe anyway. I'm not one of those landlords who just wants to move someone in as quickly as possible after the last one leaves. I always feel there's a little bit of work to be done on a room and we will take it offline for a few weeks. This was the conventional panel heater that was in room one and we took these out. They were very cheap to buy, something like 20 quid or 30 quid, and now we're using more expensive heaters that are more efficient. With the panel heater removed and a smart switch put in line with the new heater, we're able to control and measure the consumption of the new infrared that you saw last month. The Class Time Wonderwall, as it's called, can be controlled from an app. It can also have programmed scenes that bring it on at various times of the day or with various parameters. The tenant also gets a chance to change its settings as there is a control panel behind the heater. As each room becomes empty, I've been putting one of these little temperature devices on the wall. It measures the temperature in the room and displays it and also sends the readings back to me. Just a quick reminder of what the room looks like and the advert that I made didn't show the actual wardrobes. It only showed the shower unit on the left and the toilet on the right. There are wardrobes, but most of the tenants who saw the advert guessed that the bit in the middle was in fact wardrobe space. So there's another quick look at the room to see how cosy it is. Everybody's always been delighted with this room with its bay window looking out. And the house is in a very nice area called the Magazines, which we're going to have a quick look round as we end this feature from the Wirral. There are two pubs at the bottom of the road, one called the Magazine and the other one's called the Pilot Boat. You're right by the river down here, and this is also where Vale Park is, and our regular viewers will have seen some of the things in Vale Park before. And now all that remains is for me to catch the little Wallasey circular bus onto my next destination. I've been visiting Swishtoff since 2007, but most of the video you will see today is from the last five years. Swishtoff sits on the river Danube, and you'll see a line drawn down the middle of the river, and to the north of that, that's up on your screen, is Romania. Hotel Nove was one of the first we stayed at. The Billa supermarket is central to all the hotels. The pre popper is near the river and the trumpet is on Aleko Square and we visit this wherever we're staying.
When I'm staying in the Hotel Dunav or Danube, uh, I have this view of the square and of the Trumpet Pub, so I just have to walk across the road and enjoy the food and drink and the music. And they seem to be into music. The fact that they're called the Trumpet might be a clue. You will see other instruments in there. But of some interest while you're waiting for your meal to come is some of the signs on the wall. We'll pop back to the trumpet later, but now there's something going on in the square, so let's take a look down there. As you can see, there's plenty of room to sit outside when the better weather's here. There's a piece of waste land alongside the pub where we usually manage to park. And we found that over the years, some of the staff have got to know us and even know which beer to bring to the table before we even ask. This is by far the most convenient location for me in Svishtov. And when I finish filming my videos, I just pop back into my hotel room and edit them on my laptop. Here's an incident from 2023 that I managed to film. We were sitting in a bar having a drink and we saw smoke coming up from behind a tree, so we went to investigate. This was a van on fire that we never found out what caused it, whether it was vandalism or just by accident. Anyway, the nearest bar restaurant to the fire was the Macedonian Grill, so let's make that the first of the restaurants that I show you today. We'd actually been buying food from this business without even knowing it for some years because they have a sandwich bar which is around the other side and we didn't know it was even connected with them. It's a good place just to grab a snack and they do provide a couple of tables to sit out and eat it as well. Take away food that you can actually not have to take away. Here's one of our favourite restaurants that we can no longer visit. It's by the traffic lights. It's a first floor venue that you get in from the back and it's called Svoboda. Or it was and then came Covid lockdowns and so on and when it eventually came back it was called the Oasis we did go in at that time it's got a fantastic uh, first floor terrace that you can look out on the town from but the last couple of times I tried to go and eat there they were only doing private parties so I'm not sure if it's open to the public anymore if it is it's right opposite Biller at the traffic lights also opposite Biller but in a different direction is this coffee shop which recently has started serving Costa coffee one of my all-time favourites, especially in the hot weather, is down this road because it's shaded by these tall trees. It's a French cafe and we have coffee and cake here quite a lot. This next one's a little hard to find, it's in the back streets and it's called By Gagno. And we never knew what that meant until now. Now By Gagno is a name every Bulgarian knows and if you want to be critical about Bulgarian culture, you uh, or somebody, you call him a Baiganio. So what I understand from what Yana said was that if you don't like a place or a person, you can call them a Baiganio. Well, I have to say, I don't know why the restaurant have given themselves this name, but it really is a nice secluded place to have a meal. Deja Vu has been a regular haunt for drinks and snacks. We've all been there before. And this is the place where we found a kitten who crawled out from under a car and started drinking a bowl of milk, which I didn't notice before was right by my feet. 
The PR Club has uh, an inside restaurant which we've used in the cold weather in the winter but most of the time we're up on the roof terrace once again and again we have shade from the sun because they built the whole place around this big tall tree. This means there's shade particularly in the areas where mothers bring their children to play. It sometimes looks like a bit of a crash in the mornings. Something I learned from the locals about breakfast is that a lot of Bulgarians have soup. So we decided that uh, when in Rome, as, you, as they say, and this place is right by the open air market. If I've translated properly, this one's just called the Svistov restaurant. Colin and I were brought here by a photographer by the name of Slati originally, but uh, we've been back a few times since. And Colin always likes to have a sizzling meal and you can probably see why. This one's out on the road to the east of Svishtov and it's up a hill with some very nice views. Unfortunately for the last few years it hasn't been open. It was called the Hunting Lodge and this is the last time we managed to go there. I've been coming to Svishtov since 2007 and this is the very first place that I ever had some food and drink and it wasn't even finished at that time but Milen who was taking us around at the time uh, managed to talk to the owner and he let us in to have some food. We actually went back to this place in 2023 and you can see the similarity in the shots. It overlooks the river and it's a great place to have a coffee and just relax. Here you'll see photographer Colin talking to Zlati, who's from the Svistov area, and she took us around a number of places, including the human sundial, which is demonstrated here by Zlati's mum, who still lives in the area. Zlati arranged for us to see around her old school, and really is a beautiful school inside, with some great ceilings and big portraits. And I gather they have weddings here too. We were joined later by Zlati's sister, who took us down to this place. It's the house where Aleko Konstantinov was born, and it's now set up as a museum that you can go and tour around. And this man here is called Aleko Konstantinov. Aleko Konstantinov. Every Bulgarian knows this name. This is a very famous writer. Uh, he died young. He was actually killed, um, maybe by accident, maybe not. And he wrote an emblematic book. By it seems to me that if you want to know more about Bulgarian history, you could do worse than get on to Yana on Grammar, her YouTube channel. Thank you, Yana, for telling us about Alec Konstantinov. Here's some pictures from a trip I didn't actually go on and Colin went with a fellow photographer from Chester and he went down and filmed by the docks. The multi-storey car park was interesting. Um, how did they get that up there anyway? And the other thing about the shots that Colin took that day were all the birds. I'm doing my best to show you all the aspects of Svishtov that we've seen and we met the school party in our walk around the parks to look for some shade under some trees. They were apparently on some sort of history lesson and they were looking around at some of the old buildings.
I mentioned that we had uh, breakfast soup by the market uh, earlier on. This is the market as filmed on a Sunday in 2019. Um, it at the time was running on a Sunday and a Thursday, but I think I've noticed it open on other days in the years since then. So if you're thinking of visiting the Swishtoff market, check out which days it's going to be on. The pre-popper hotel isn't quite as convenient for the town centre, but it is just a short walk up the hill to the Billa supermarket. But Monuments Park is a point of interest which isn't that far along the river from there. There's a complete history lesson involved with Monuments Park, including that tall monument itself. A lot of the stuff is only in Bulgarian, so you'd be as well to take your Google with you and uh, find out more about it as you go around. Another place we went to when staying at the Pre-Popper was we walked down to the riverfront. You can't tell from the map, but it's quite a steep drop down to the riverfront and therefore a steep walk when you come back up. A bit of a winding road as well, but it's well worth it. It's very chilled down there. From down here on the riverfront you can look across to Zimnica in Romania and there's a ferry that goes from Svishtov to Zimnica and as you can just about see in the photo uh, it takes quite a number of trucks. You don't have to be here very long before you find out where the important places are. The hospital, the banks, the mobile phone shops, don't forget them. And there are plenty of little supermarkets, but Billa is a German supermarket which is the biggest and it's right in the centre of town. Those who know me well will also know that I love my coffee. And the good news is that even when all the cafes are shut, 24-hour machines are available to serve the coffee on the street. It really isn't bad either. There's also little shop units which are more or less a serve yourself affair with all sorts of coffee, cold drinks, snacks. And it's all there just for putting some money in. And it's very cheap by our standards. What about public transport? Well, I've only ever come into Swishtoff by train, but there's a bus station just down the road from there, and I intend to try that sometime this year. There's a fair bit of freight traffic on the railways, with there being the docks just along the road from here. Here's another video clip from 13 years ago, is that? And uh, it was the Siemens trains which they had running for a while. But the good news is that some of those trains have now come back, and I spotted one when I was there last year. As for the weather, well, Svishtov has occasional storms, a bit like the ones we've seen in Spain. They're very fierce and they come on suddenly. And I was caught in shorts and t-shirt when this one broke. I was on my way up to the supermarket. I had to stand in a shop doorway, but half an hour later, it all cleared, it was gone, and I was back on my way to Villa. Bit of lightning for you now, and I filmed this from the balcony of the Hotel Nove, which looks across the river. This storm was actually over Romania, didn't affect us at all, but the lightning is quite amazing. This picture shows Svoboda across the road on the first floor there. That's the restaurant that uh, no longer opens to the public, it would seem. Because I stay in a hotel which is right opposite Aleko Square, I tended to get lazy in the winter when it was really cold and just always cross the road to the trumpet.
Well, that's my short recap of the times we've had in Swishtoff, and I look forward to going back there again soon. It's time for a beer. So there was our little look back at Swishtoff. We've been going there uh, regularly for the last five years, apart from when Covid was on. And as you gathered, I first went there in 2007 when I bought my first house on the hill. One more thing for this month. Well, lots of things actually. We call them the bits and pieces, or Brian's bits. And I think we need the drums to get this going, don't we? Drummer, are you ready? We're at New Brighton Wirral to start off, and King's Parade is the riverfront promenade that you normally drive along to get to the shops at Morrison's. However, on the day that I've taken the next piece of footage, we were all diverted along the back road, which keeps us away from those crashing waves. If you can imagine, well, you don't have to imagine because you can have a look, um, the size of the waves coming off the River Mersey, uh, they'll also be tossing up stones and all sorts of other garbage. And if you drive along the King's Parade, your car is not only going to get flooded with water, seawater at that it's going to get stones and everything chucked at it as well so the police actually closed it off and we made our way down towards the retail park where Morrison's is only when we got to the roundabout we had to turn back and find another way there because the waves had already blocked that route once you actually get to Morrison's car park you're set back enough from the river not to get affected On a brighter note, outside our flats, the gardens are looking good, the laburnum's out, and as they say, everything in the garden is rosy. The Bank of England base rate has been destroying businesses and making people homeless for the last 12 months, and they still can't see that they're doing the wrong thing. And in Liverpool, the St John's Precinct is still trading as far as the shops and the popular food court are concerned. But St John's Market now has about a million and a half owed in rent, and they've had to close it down. The good news is you can still get your Everton baby wear in the main building. If you're a regular viewer, you'll know I'm fanatical about transport interchanges and getting all public transport to come together in one place. Something to do with the Burt Bacharach song, Trains and Boats and Planes, that got me started. Um, this is a venue where we actually have planes. Most of the times I have to say, well, there's no planes here, mate. Uh, there's no boats here. This is Birmingham, the international airport. And the trains come into Birmingham International Station. Uh, the buses come into a terminus below that. And this monorail comes in because it'll take you across to Birmingham International Airport. And you're there ready to board your plane without actually really leaving the building. The reason I'm on this monorail today is not to catch a plane. It's because the National Express coaches go from the airport and not from the train station. You may have guessed from the fact that I'm sitting at the front that the train is driverless completely autonomous system, trains going both directions, the control of the passengers, the announcements, the screens, the doors opening and closing, it's all automatic. Back to the topic of money and finance and the way to save yourself from the traditional finance systems crashing is to have some Bitcoin. Most people don't seem to have even been aware of Bitcoin yet, but those who have have made quite a lot of money. I have to point out I wasn't a customer of this beauty parlour in Wisbeach. I just had to pop my head round and have a look at this desk. And so to Burnley. I have these pictures because Steve Bushby, who's doing the bungalow development and filming it with his new DJI camera, 
is also a member of Burnley Camera Club, which meets every Tuesday. And he took these pictures of one of their open nights and I put it together for him. Unfortunately, nobody can have lunch with the Queen anymore, but at this pub in Mould in Flintshire, you can at least go and see the Queen's head before you dine. I'm at Seacombe Ferry, opposite Liverpool on the River Mersey, and you can see the progress with the Everton ground that they're building from here. Uh, you can also, of course, see all the well-known skyline of Liverpool from the ferry terminal. One of the things that I do from time to time is walk along the promenade, but on this day I decided a slightly different route. Higher up than the promenade level, there is a pathway along through the trees, which on a warm day, which this wasn't by the way, uh, it was probably good for shelter. I had a reason for staying up at street level though because I wanted to see what was going on around Wallasey Town Hall. Now for decades now there have been buildings either side of the Town Hall that belong to the council and indeed I've visited council offices there myself over the years. Well one of them's completely knocked down and the other one's in the process of being knocked down so what's going to be happening there? Well the sign tells you. Well, I can't go through a month without looking at a bit of new technology. Uh, there was a time when I used to buy most of the things that came out when they were new, which cost me a fortune over the years. Don't do that anymore. But here's one to look out for. It's a transparent TV screen. When it's turned off, it can then show you the wall behind. Now, it's up to you how you use this and what you put behind your TV. Uh, they've given some ideas in this uh, video advertising the concept. And it appears you can have a kind of ticker line that stays switched on at the bottom of the screen that displays pertinent information information about the weather, news headlines, perhaps even phone calls and things that you're receiving if you can link it to your phone. I wonder how long it'll be before it becomes cheap enough to buy. I've been to the home building and renovating show again this year and they've been celebrating 30 years of doing this. Uh, nothing much new as far as I'm concerned and I'm not doing uh, a lot of home building at the moment but I was interested in these wooden sculptures. The lad on the stand told me they take two to three months to make so you can imagine what the price tag is. I think I better go and have a lie down. Because if you're not into home building and renovation, perhaps you're into classic cars and restoration, because they were just across the way. And I'm not going to say I'm going to egg you on to going into this one. Time for one last feature. Let's go back to Lower Heswell on the Wirral. We're having our coffee under cover in case it rains. There's lots of clouds overhead. Uh, we came down to go to Sheldrake's uh, because you used to be able to go there for a drink on the beach. Sheldrakes has been demolished more or less and is being rebuilt so here we are in Yacht. We've been here once before a few years ago. It's spelt Y-O-T except it isn't. The O is actually uh, a Greek symbol so we're still going to call it Yacht because however else do we know to pronounce it. But here we are having a coffee break. So let's fly in and take a last look at Sheldrake's before it's transformed completely. And this is a view of the dining area that was up on the roof terrace. And this is the architect's view of the new house they're building there. Anything that's built down here will have views across the D estuary and to the North Wales hills. And the other feature down here is all the boats, which at the moment are stranded, but from time to time there is some water here.
That's all the bits and pieces I've got time for this month, which is a shame because Radio Caroline celebrated its 60th birthday a few weeks ago, and I was going to do a little thing about that as a tribute, but that'll have to wait because we're overrunning already, and I will come back to Radio Caroline next month. Well, there's rather a lot of bits and pieces for you this month. Hope you enjoyed those, and there'll no doubt be more next month as I have my camera with me all the time. It's not called a pocket camera for nothing. So that's the end of the Maythorn Monthly for April. We're springing into my birthday month of May. Hooray! You know, you don't get anything at my age. Anyway, we'll see you next month. <laughs> <laughs>